Greetings, grace and peace from God the Father, and from his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Pastor Rod here, and on behalf of the churches of Iamsville and Flint Hill, we welcome you to this week's virtual worship service on this 26th day of June in 2022, which is the third Sunday after Pentecost. Now, would you please join me in prayer? Lord, we want to follow you wherever you lead. Reach out to us this day, stirring our souls and spirits with the winds of your power, that we may faithfully be your disciples. If we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Disciple. It's not just a title. But it is a word that we all hear and use because it's a part of our Christian vocabulary. It's, it's a part of the Christian lingo. But what does that word mean and what are its implications for us? I'm sure we could come up with many answers. The dictionary defines it as one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another, which implies a devote, devoted allegiance to the teachings of one chosen as a master. If we go to the more biblical specific definition of disciple, it is a follower of Christ, one who believes his doctrine, rests on his sacrifices, receives his spirit, and imitates his example. Translated from the Greek, Methides, it refers generally to any student, pupil, apprentice, or adherent, as opposed to a teacher. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus commissions us to go because of his authority and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So as a disciple, I think it's safe to say we are followers, students, worshipers, servants, witnesses to and for Jesus. So what are some ways we can and are disciples of Jesus. Perhaps going to church to worship, attending Bible studies to learn, sharing or witnessing your testimony with people out in the park or in the streets of downtown or in your workplace even, being a servant at the local food bank or rescue mission and pretty much leading a life that would be approved by God. The problem is, however, many times we are disciples when it is convenient to us or when it fits into our schedule. Sometimes our lives get in the way of us attending church or even personal prayer time and devotion time at home. I need to cancel working at the rescue mission this week because I was invited to go shopping with my friend or I just don't have time to go to Bible study this week because my schedule just filled up. Do you see what we're doing here? We're fitting Jesus into our schedule. We're fitting him into our schedule when it works out for us. We say we are a true disciple, but only when we have time for it. Being a disciple isn't always a commitment to us, but it's often a convenience. But the reality of it is being a disciple is not just a title. It requires much, much more. There's a cost for it. And this is exactly what Jesus is addressing in our gospel reading from Luke this morning. Please open your Bibles to me, uh, with me, to Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 62, so we can read this together. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned to rebuke them, and, and they went to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you will go. And Jesus said to him, 
Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their dead. But as far as you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is feet fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the very first verse, verse 51, Jesus is really setting the tone for us to be serious in our call to be a disciple. It said, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. You see, Jesus is about to go all in with the completion of his mission. And he needs all of his disciples, including us, to be all in with him. It speaks of the days drawing near for him to be taken up. We learned several weeks ago where taking up will lead Jesus. It is speaking of his ascension into heaven after he had been crucified to be with his father. And his face set to go to Jerusalem refers to Jesus making his final journey to Jerusalem where he resolves to fulfill the mission for which God sent him into the world. His date with the cross. Jesus knew that his time on earth was ending and that the time drew near for his return to heaven. In other words, Jesus knew that he would soon die and that his death awaited him in Jerusalem. It is getting real serious for Jesus at this point, and he is telling his disciples, and not just the chosen twelve, but the multitude that have begun to follow him, that it is time for them to get really serious as well with regard to following him, because after all, after Jesus was gone, they would be the ones that would carry out his mission. You see, Jesus was about to go pay off a cost for us to follow him. And to follow him, there is a cost for us to pay as well. He gives us three examples in today's reading, three men who could have become disciples, but would not meet the conditions that Jesus laid down. The first man was identified in Matthew's version of the story as a scribe or a teacher of the law. He was once an enemy of Jesus, but decided to cross over onto the J-team. Verse 57 says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. This would-be disciple approaches Jesus, promised to follow him to any and all destinations. He had no clue where Jesus was going. And he volunteered to go until he heard the cost that he had to deny himself. Jesus desires this man to understand what following him means, using illustrations from the world of mammals and birds. Foxes have holes in which to reside, and birds build nests for themselves and their young. Jesus, however, is the Son of Man, cannot call anywhere his home. He has no permanent residence or fixed location to call his own. Thus, the man who claims he would follow Jesus everywhere must realize that following Jesus requires being willing to forsake one's own home, even his possessions. We read a little further in Luke 10 where Jesus sent out the 72, and he said, Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. And as far as where you stay on your journey, whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be on this house, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon it and remain at that house, eating and drinking what they provide. But nothing's guaranteed. To be a follower or a disciple is not going to be glamorous. It won't be an easy life. You must be willing to leave your home behind you and all that goes with it. You see, Jesus offers no guarantees or comfort with the security that comes from having a place in which to dwell. Apparently, this would-be follower was accustomed to a comfortable home and was not willing to give that up. You see, to be Jesus' to be Jesus' disciple, a person must willingly put aside worldly security. 
And then we have the second man who was actually called by Jesus. Wow, what an honor. And this was unlike the first man who volunteered. But he was rejected because he would not take up the cross and, and die to self. He was worried about his father's funeral when he should have been planning his own. Jesus is not suggesting that we dishonor our parents, but only that we not permit our love for our family to weaken our love for the Lord. In reality, however, the death of his father had not yet occurred. Had his father died, he would be have been buried on the same day as the way of the culture at that time. So I really doubt this man would be with Jesus on the day that his father died. Instead, I believe this person was hanging around for his father to die. Why? Because also in that culture, the son would receive all the inheritance from his father. Was that more important than following Jesus? Was receiving this worldly wealth the reason for this man wanting to put his discipleship on hold for the time being? And this led to Jesus' response. Let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead, which points out to those who want to follow him should, not, should count the cost and set aside any conditions they might have. In other words, let those who are spiritually dying, those who have not responded to the call to commitment, stay home and handle responses such as burying the dead. Now, this may sound insensitive, but it, it had precedence. A high priest and those who had taken the Nazarite vow to re were required by law to avoid the corpse or even a, a parent. A later Jewish precedent says that if there were enough people in attendance, a student of the Torah should not stop his studying to bury the dead, even if it was his father. Jesus placed commitment to God even above these precedents. As God's son, Jesus did not hesitate to demand complete loyalty. Even family loyalty as was not to take priority over the demands of obedience to the command to go and preach the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus' direct challenge forces believers to evaluate their own priorities, and this man's priorities were totally out of whack. We should love Christ so much that our love for our family would look like hatred in comparison. If we go to the 14th chapter of Luke in verse 26, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Then we have a third person. third person approaches, uh, and this one, like the first, expressed his desire to follow Jesus. He wasn't called, but he volunteered. Verse 61 says, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, this man expressed his desire to follow Jesus. However, this man also had something he wanted to do first. <clears throat> Jesus ascertained in this potential follower a sense of reluctance an unfortunate willingness to put something else ahead of following Jesus. His own personal agenda would be more important than following the agenda of Jesus. Now, this was not the type of follower Jesus needed. Jesus saw that this man's heart was not wholly with it. He wasn't at all in with Jesus, but that he would be plowing and looking back over his shoulder. If we are to be followers of Jesus, we must decide wholeheartedly to follow him. It is here where Jesus makes a definitive statement for all who would follow him. This is a difficult statement for many to accept, as Jesus declares that those who will follow him must never look back to what he has left behind. There is nothing to look back to. The world has nothing to offer, and there is nothing more important in our lives than being of service to our Lord. Sadly, many have taken hold of the gospel plow, making a profession and starting out strong, but the lure of the world enticed them to return. They never reached the place where Jesus was their sole desire. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying this life, but we cannot return to the ways of the world. It is impossible to plow a straight row 
while looking back. We will never be what the Lord desires us to be or realize our full potential if there are other things that we must do before we serve the Lord. We cannot put Jesus on the back burner. One who serves the Lord must make the commitment to serve him above all else. The call of Joshua reminds for each of us today, choose you this day whom you will serve. Where's your allegiance today? Whom have you chosen to serve? Will it be the Lord or are there other desires of this world that have to come first? If the passion and desire is not there, we will never continue to be of service and we will never be a disciple. Now, I don't think Jesus really wants us not to have a home or nice things. I don't think he really wants us to hate our families. I don't think he really wants us not to enjoy some blessings of this world. But what he is saying here is none of these should come before him and be more, more important to you than him. Jesus must come first in every as, facet of your life. To be a follower of Christ, you must take these things into consideration and count the cost. Have you done that? Jesus must be our priority. Have you counted the cost? Are you willing to pay the price to serve the Lord? Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you committed to continuing the course? Serving Jesus will cost you something. Have you counted the cost of following Jesus? I ask you to understand this. Following Jesus is far more valuable than anything this world offers you. It's definitely not easy, but know this. The cost of following Jesus is well worth the reward. Luke 14, 14. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, let me never see myself as anything more than a follower of you and never let me lean on the flesh. May I never seek to be anything more than a follower. Please allow me to quickly see what, when I am seeking to lead myself and as quickly step in line behind you. I pray for a decreasing fear of what may come in following you by a greater understanding of your majesty, wonder and incomprehensible nature and work. I know that being a follower of you is the greatest blessing, calling and endeavor that a human can be allowed the privilege of receiving. And I am so grateful every day for the blessings of your blessings. Your ways are higher than my ways. And your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Please help me submit fully to your lordship in my life and give me the strength to resist the desires of my flesh. Help me to not deny myself and relinquish all that I have and all that I am for you. Destroy my attachment to this world so that I can fully rely on your every situation. Lord, I want to develop a strong relationship with you and to be your disciple. Help me to continue to pursue this goal every day and help others do the same. I give my entire self over to you, Lord. Amen. And now as you go, know that you have been healed and restored in Christ Jesus. Go in peace, proclaiming the good news of God's absolute eternal love through ministries of peace and hope. Amen. Have a blessed week.